Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about 1,4 additions to Michael acceptors, and I'm going to highlight a lot of electrophilicity parameters from work of Mayer and co-workers. So even if you know about 1,4 additions, it's worth paying attention to the lecture today because electrophilicity parameters play a really big role in understanding organic chemistry in general. But before we get into that, let's look at the problems I assigned last lecture. So in this first problem, we take this ketone with a methyl group, and we want to form in one set of conditions a benzylated product where the other carbon on the left is alkylated, and under a second set of conditions, we want to afford a product where the methylated carbon is also benzylated. And so, as stated here, multiple steps may be required. So first, let's look at the benzylated product. So one way that we can do this is by lithiating in situ. So that's the kinetically accessible proton. So if we treat this with LDA, that'll be most readily deprotonated. If we uh, leave this for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then we put in some benzyl bromide warm to room temperature, then we'll get this benzylated product upon workup. Now, you might be wondering from the previous lecture, how come we don't have to make a TMS enol ether? We highlighted that it could be beneficial to in some cases. Well, in this case, um, because this is a rigid system, if we form an enolate, we can only form the E xenolate, uh, the E enolate, because the Z enolate can't be formed via rotation. For an alkylation reaction like this, it may not matter whether or not you use that E or Z enolate, um, and that's just because we're not adding a chiral nucleophile, so there should only be addition to one side regardless. Okay, so in the next example. Um, we have to form the TMS enolate. And why is that? So if you recall from the previous lecture, if we add in a uh, TMS, or if we add in a nucleophile, uh, rather an electrophile, to an enol ether, which is in equilibrium, we might get a mixture of products that could be challenging to separate. So first, what we have to do is we have to trap this with uh, TMS chloride doing a triethylamine reflux in DMF. So this is the slow reaction, probably takes like a day or two. Once we've uh, isolated this product via chromatography, there will be like slight uh, minor product where the alkene is in the kinetic position rather than the thermodynamic position. But once we isolate the thermodynamic TMS enol ether and we treat it with benzyl bromide, we're able to form the benzylated product. Now, one thing I want to highlight here is instead of using methyl lithium as an initiator, it's possible to use another uh, activator such as fluoride. And so the way fluoride works is fluoride can attack at the TMS uh, enol ether, which then frees up the enolate to do chemistry. And the reason we do this is the nucleophilicity of a TMS enol ether is kind of in the realm of like seven or so, whereas the enolate more has an N of like 10 to 15. So you quite greatly increase the nucleophilicity when you unmask the TMS enol ether. Now, if you recall from previous lectures, when um, we have an SN1 type addition to a TMS enol ether, that can still occur in the presence of a Lewis acid, and that's because the electrophilicity of a naked carbocation is so high, like it's positive electrophilicity of like 5 to 10, and so that's a reaction that's still doable. But when we have a normal SN2 type reaction with like an alkyl halide, um, we, have to use, uh, we have to use an enolate rather than an enol ether. Okay, so in the next problem, we take this ketone here and we treat it with LDA. And the question is, is it a kinetic or a thermodynamic process? And so in this case, LDA is a bulky base. Uh, at minus 78, it will very rapidly deprotonate the uh, ketone in the most kinetically accessible position. And so you'll get the kinetic enolate. Now, if you wanted to get the thermodynamic enolate, you could use the, you could use a substoichiometric amount of LDA, as I've mentioned previously, like 0.8 or 0.9 equivalents, and you leave it for a long time to equilibrate, equ equilibrate towards the thermodynamic product. Because some of the starting material still remains protonated, you're able to have some proton exchange, and so slowly you'll accumulate some more of the thermodynamic enolate. Because I didn't specify in this problem the equivalence of LDA, you could still arrive at the thermodynamic enolate if you're planning on using 0.8 to 0.9 equivalents, and you leave it for a long time. Okay, so now let's get into today's material, 1,4 additions and electrophilicity parameters. So Michael acceptors are when you have an electron withdrawing group uh, in conjugation with a double or a triple bond. 
So in this case, we have a carbonyl as our electron withdrawing group with a triple bond as our uh, Michael acceptor. Michael acceptors accept electron density into the beta position, putting a negative charge on the, the alpha position. However, it doesn't need to just be a carbonyl. CF3 groups also help this process a little bit, but something like a cyano with a trifluoromethyl would be more reactive even than just a cyano on its own. So electron withdrawing groups help this, but if it's conjugated, then it's a much better Michael acceptor. Uh, we could also have functional groups like a sulfone, and if you have two electron withdrawing groups, such as this diester here, which is a derivative of something called meldrum's acid, uh, after being treated with formaldehyde, we can greatly increase the reactivity of our uh, electrophile by like 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 10, which is dramatically more reactive. Um, if you're curious about like how you can wager these as an intermediate instead of just using a carbonyl compound, there's something called the acetoacetic acid synthesis um, or diethylmalonate, malonic ester synthesis where you can have a carbonyl present and then decarboxylate in a subsequent step. This is a topic I might cover in a future video if there's interest. And so in general, as I was trying to highlight, if you have a good Michael acceptor, it'll have an electron withdrawing group which is conjugated with a double or triple bond. However, if you have two electron withdrawing groups, this makes it a much, much better electrophile. Now, in terms of N parameters, there's also E parameters. So N parameters are derived from the attack of a nucleophile on a carbocation via an SN1 type process. It's determined using physical chemistry. Um, and you might think to yourself, like, I'm, I think physical chemistry is really boring. Most of the time, I would agree with you. But it turns out that if you can calculate the N parameters and E parameters of most nucleophiles and electrophiles respectively, you can basically figure out why every organic reaction works more or less, which is pretty huge. And today I'm hoping that I can convince you of that. So E parameters and N parameters, while they've been uh, reported on by Mayer and coworkers for quite a long time, they still haven't seen a lot of light. And it's unfortunate because it's a game changer once you understand them. So if we have an E that's more negative, it's less reactive. So something like cyanoacrylate or um, acrylonitrile is another word for this. We have an E of minus 19. However, as we start getting to better electron withdrawing groups, um, we start having an increase in electrophilicity. And just to remind you, if this was rounded to minus 17 versus minus 19, that means that this is 100 times more reactive. And so just because we have a double bond uh, in conjugation with an electron withdrawing group doesn't mean that they have similar reactivity because something like this um, uh, malonic anhydride, or maleic anhydride rather, uh, also is similar it still has eight orders of magnitude difference in reactivity, which is very dramatic. So that means there's a lot more nucleophiles that will add to this than will add to this uh, in a kinetically significant manner. However, if we have something like this derivative of Meldrum's acid, this is an even better electrophile. So more nucleophiles could add to this. And so another factor that can influence how electrophilic one of these Michael acceptors is, is whether or not there's steric bulk on the alpha or beta carbon. And so here you can see cyclohexenone, it has an E of minus 22. If we have a methyl group in the alpha position, that blocks uh, some you know, addition of the nucleophile, so that's going to retard the addition rate uh, to some extent, in this case about five orders of magnitude. However, it's it even more significantly impacted if you have a methyl group on the beta carbon where the nucleophile would add. So very few nucleophiles would, would add to this compared to cyclohexanone. So if you're ever doing chemistry or if you're proposing chemical transformations on substituted uh, Michael acceptors, you're going to have to use harsher conditions to make them work if they'll work at all. And so one really useful way to look at this is this figure from Mayer and Coworkers Lab. And so essentially most organic transformations that you can think of will fall somewhere on this plot. So here you can see different nucleophiles. Really poor nucleophiles would include like benzene, which is why they have an N of like minus five or so. And really good nucleophiles would be like uh, acido acetic acid or acido acetone or uh, dicyanomethane. Alternatively, you could have this nitroethane, which is a very, very good nucleophile. Okay, and then if we look at the electrophilicity, uh, then we can see these Michael acceptors would be like quite poor. And then as we go down, we have more and more reactive electrophiles like this ter 
tert-butyl carbocation. Now, because we're talking about Michael acceptors, they tend to be relatively low in electrophilicity compared to carbocationic species. Okay, so what matters most is looking at the N parameter of your nucleophile and the E parameter of your electrophile. There's also this like coefficient, the slope specific parameter of your nucleophile. Basically what this means is uh, it's intrinsic to your nucleophile. It'll determine, uh, it's like, it'll multiply the, the sum of these two together. And so it could only influence stuff sometimes. I, I think it's more significant to look at N and E for the most part, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, most chemical reactions that we observe that like we are talking about throughout this course and throughout content we haven't discussed yet is going to have a sum of n and e uh, also times by the coefficient by between minus five and five and so if it's less than minus five it's so slow that you're probably not going to observe it or you're going to have to heat the living daylights out of it if it's like minus 10 it's never going to happen like you're never going to see it happen ever um, within like the heat death of the universe kind of thing so if you uh, see an, an N plus E of like greater than 10, it's gonna be smoking fast. And so that means you have to control those reactions, otherwise they could run away, or it could be so exothermic that the reaction can just go to tar. So it's important to consider like what the nucleophilicity of your nucleophile is and what the electrophilicity of your electrophile is. And so as I was trying to say, the SN parameter, the slope parameter matters very little compared to the N and E values unless SN is a very, very small number, which would basically be like, it's a bulky nucleophile, um, but in general, S and N values tend to be around one. So if you times this by one, it's more or less the same. Okay, so this is a really useful figure. If you wanna download it yourself, you can go to this link here. And I wanna thank Mayer and coworkers for making this excellent figure. Okay, so some things to consider for one, four additions is that most Michael acceptors have an E of approximately minus 20 to minus 15. Yes, there are exceptions that are more electrophilic, um, and yes, there are exceptions where they're less electrophilic, but most of them around minus 20 to minus 15. And so if you want a nucleophile to add with decent kinetics, because we want the range to be, you know, between minus five and five, we want it to be a reasonably good reaction. So we should be picking a nucleophile with an N of around 15 for most uh, Michael acceptors. So if the reaction is too sluggish, sometimes you can accelerate the process by making your electrophile more electrophilic. Sometimes this can be accomplished with transition metals, other Lewis acids, or you can make imeniums or imines, which are a little bit more reactive than a typical ketone or aldehyde. Um, but when you use a catalyst to accelerate your reaction, you're also going to be accelerating side reactions potentially, and so that's an important consideration. So let's start with sulfur nucleophiles. So you could have a thiolate, which is just a deprotonated thiol or mercaptan. You could also have a sulfonate, which is just an SO2R minus. These typically have an N of between 18 and 20. So these are good, good nucleophiles. And remember your N plus E should be at least greater than minus five. So here's one example from the literature where we take thiophenol and we add it to this uh, methyl vinyl ether or methyl vinyl ketone rather in the presence of triethylamine. And it was reported that this is obtained in 100% conversion. Now, if we look at the E of uh, methyl vinyl ketone, we have a value of minus 16.8. If we look at the N of our thiophenolate, we have an N of approximately 23. And so if we add up these values, we have a net of 6.6. .6. And so this should be a reasonably fast reaction. Now you might say, uh, hey, you didn't consider the slope parameter. But remember, for most most of the time, it matters more what the E and the N value are than what the SN value are, uh, or what the SN value is, rather. So this is going to be a reasonably fast reaction, which is why it can be done at room temp in 18 hours in THF. Okay, nitrogen nucleophiles are another common nucleophile that you'll see adding to Michael acceptors. And most of the time, these are secondary amines, but sometimes you'll also see primary amines. And so these are the N value ranges approximately for those two classes of nitrogen nucleophiles. And so in this case, we have uh, cyclohexanone, and that reacts with morpholine and at the beta position. And if we look at the N and the E values here, we actually have a relatively low value, which is minus 5.14. So this is going to be a pretty slow reaction if we only were adding to cyclohexanone. However, one thing worth, con worth considering is that when you have a ketone, ketones can react with secondary amines to form ameniums. And because this is a positively charged species, this is actually a better electrophile. And so while there aren't experimentally derived E electrophilicity parameters, 
for ketone-based uh, imenium microacceptors. Um, I would guess based on precedent for aldehydes that we would go from an E of minus 22 to around minus 19, but that's just my best guess. So you could say that this would accelerate the reaction uh, approximately a thousand fold. So this would be one way to improve the reaction by using an imenium catalyst. Now in our case, the product can also add into the beta position. So uh, you could only use this if, uh, you could use similar ideas if you could form the imenium without doing also the conjugate addition. And so uh, one catalyst you could use for something like that would be proline. Um, proline is a great amino acid catalyst that accelerates these types of reactions. Now, enolates. Enolates are deprotonated uh, ketones like we were talking about earlier. TMS enol ethers tend to only have an, uh, an N of around seven or so. And once we've deprotected them and reopened them up as like an anionic enolate, we have a much higher nucleophilicity value. So this is like a million times or or much greater uh, increase in reactivity. So in this case, we have the addition of um, diethylmalonate to methyl vinyl ether. In the presence of potassium hydroxide, this is just generating the enolate in situ. And this was obtained in 83% yield, although no reaction times were given. Um, and so if we put in these values, we can see that this is a reasonably fast reaction. Okay, this is a positive value. This is going to work fairly well. Now, instead of using an enolate, we can use something called an enamine. And the nice thing about enamines is they can be prepared and isolated ahead of time. And so the way that these are obtained is you just treat a ketone with a secondary amine and under dehydrating conditions, which could be molecular sieves or um, just distillation, depending on your secondary amine, like using toluene or something to drive off water azeotropically, we can obtain these enamines. And so enamines have a typically high uh, nucleophilicity. However, if you use proline, proline massively is more nucleophilic. And so because it's an amino acid, it's abundantly available. You can, uh, you can increase these reactions even better with proline. And because this is just getting hydrolyzed off the product back to a ketone, it doesn't matter too much what uh, the secondary amine is that we use. Some secondary amines will work better. You could use something like pyrrolidine. However, proline would be better in most cases. And so like we were saying before, our N plus E should be approximately minus five or greater. And so here, we, if we add these up, we can see our N plus E is around minus 5.36. And so this is a slow reaction, which is why they had to use a reflux to accelerate it. And uh, one consideration is I just wanted to highlight that this is your intermediate. And then upon workup, this gets hydrolyzed back to the ketone and the alpha position of this enolate gets protonated back to form the ketone. And so for this lecture, I'd like to assign a couple practice problems or maybe three even, and I'd like you to determine whether or not the following reactions would be uh, spontaneous or not, like whether they'll be fast or slow. So would this reaction work using the principles that we were just talking about? Uh, another reaction would be this one, addition to this uh, maliumide. Uh, and finally, this example where we have uh, maleic anhydride with this uh, enamine, would this reaction work? And so with that, I hope this has been a really useful introduction into electrophilicity parameters and Michael acceptors. Um, if you like the style uh, that I've been doing using electrophilicity parameters in this lecture, let me know in the comments. I think this makes organic chem chemistry really intuitive, and I really like using them to understand organic chemistry. And so I hope you have a great day, and any questions or comments, leave them below. Have a good one.